Welcome to Unlock Your Soul with Antonio Soul. Today is a very special and exclusive um, production with one of Ukraine's renowned, most renowned um, journalists. I'm talking about Natalia Gumenyuk, who is the CEO and founder of Public Interest Journalism Lab. And I want us to talk about you know, the timeline of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, and most importantly, how you're able to navigate, um, you know, your work as journalist in the midst of all the war. But before we do so, I just want to know, Natalia, how are you doing? How is life? How are you coping? So thank you so much for asking. I'm very glad to hear and remember very well my short brief visit to Nairobi in December last year. Mm. Uh, very inspiring. And of course, it's now we just marked 500 days of the uh, full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine. Yeah. And people are adjusting, of course. We're trying to live our life as normal as possible. It's not because there are the risks. The war is cruel, mm. uh, but uh, you know we, we we try and do the best of it because you know like even if we are tired, uh, what else to do? It's our country, it's our life. You try to pursue as much as possible. So mm. thank you for asking. Okay, so let's let's go back to literally one and a half years ago, um, and we're talking about February of 2022 when the invasion happened. I mean, if you remember where you were and what was happening, sort of give us a rundown of, you know, of what was really going on in your mind and around you that time. Um, so look, I'm the journalist. I have experience in coverage foreign wars. And also we had the Russian invasion, not of that scale for the last eight years. Mm. So when there were all these talks that something might happen big, to be honest, I was also, as I think as president of Ukraine, as many Ukrainians, a bit in denial uh, yeah. because we thought like it couldn't happen. It cannot be so blunt. In the end, why to do something obvious in the 21st century, you know, to bomb the capital uh, like it was during the Second World War? Who would yeah. dare to do that, you know? Yeah. We expected something more hybrid, more kind of, you know, some different types of, 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 of the ways, maybe in the part of the country or so. Yeah. So I was at home and I did hear the, the explosions. So there was the, you know, attempt to uh, destroy the... Ukrainian air defense system and I, I, I was working. I mean, I woke up and all of a sudden we were, you know, I was running around the, the Kiev, the capital and mm. then traveling within the country all the time. But even now, you know, a lot of people asking me and everybody, did we believe, you know, why we were so naive, uh, um, you know, not to be better prepared. You still believe in the best and yeah. you still believe in the rationality and the logic. Yeah. It, it, you know, this war brought nothing good to Russia itself. It, mm. it brought nothing. It, mm. you know, they, were, they, they said, like, we will, you know, take Ukraine within four days. It didn't happen. It's yeah. five days. The losses are sad and, gre and, 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 and the situation isn't really good. But, mm. you know, we know that in the part of the country which are occupied the Russians, there the things are, you know, ha are the worst. So wherever we are now, we are still, you know, in, in our own land, in our own place, in our cities, in our capital, where people try to live their life more or less as normal. There's a famous a phrase, you know, 4 a.m. Kiev is bombed. And you're like, you write in The Guardian that every Ukrainian and Russian kid knows it. That's how the announcement of the German bombardment of Kiev in 1941 sounded. But here we are. Um, you know, sort of one and a half years ago, 24th of February, where at 5 a.m. Kiev is bombed by Russia. Did you ever, you know, when you started journalism, when you started, you know, studying and, you know, writing stories and telling stories of other, you know, sort of um, other atrocities happening around the world, did you ever think that this would happen to Kiev, to Russia, to Ukraine, I beg your pardon, in your time? Definitely not. Uh, you know, now, a lot, retrospectively, a lot of people said, like, it was coming. You know, mm. it was coming. Yeah. Uh, it's really more dependent on the regime change in Russia. Uh, you really think that the government, you know, there is some logic. There should be some logic. There is some benefit. There is no benefit. Mm. Uh, and and till now, uh, you know, you still believe in something good in people. That uh, So, for instance, now, when I retrospectively meet some people which I was in touch during the first 
first months of the war yeah. and who also were hesitant and saying that would, you know, maybe the Russians wouldn't fight. Maybe they wouldn't go to the, you know, battlefield if they're forced to do that. Mm. But, you know, after the first month, we discovered the real atrocities of the uh, in, in the outskirts of Kiev, yeah. in the town of Bucha, where hundreds of people were executed, like really not killed, but mm. really executed mm. because, you know, they were found in the mass grave with the hands handcuffed yeah. and the, the bullets in their in the head. So it's yeah. not really like the accidental death of the, you know, explosions or things like that. Yeah. Then a lot of people said, like, we didn't believe. Uh, uh-huh. But, uh, but but we need to accept. I think what Ukrainians and me as well, somebody who was following other wars as well, mm. didn't understand that we probably treated, you know, the Russian army as, you know, maybe another post-Soviet army, which is okay, big, but not that good, but, but kind of corrupt, but maybe partially normal. Mm. We miss the part that during these years, Russian were fighting in, uh, you know, Chechnya and committed a lot of atrocities. Yeah. They were committing a lot of atrocities for many, many years in Syria. Yeah. So this is a different type of army. They used to these things. We yeah. are not. For us, in our imagination, these wars as well were far away. So we thought, you know, they're just maybe the people who given the order by the dictator, but would they commit atrocities? Maybe not. Now we know it is there. I'm running the project on documenting war crimes. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so far the Ukrainian General Prosecutor Office registered more than 100, around 100,000 all over the country of different scale, of different yeah. scale of war. Some yeah. are worse, some, you know, maybe less severe. Yeah. But uh, we, we can really say that it, it's really the war for, you know, o- occupying the land. Yeah. You know, you know, so, so, uh, so that's something hard to accept, but we need to accept. Uh, but also, I mean, in terms of acceptance, you know, there's also, a, a, you know, also a lot of, you know, agony and grief that, you know, goes around. And you still have to tell these stories as a, journal- as a journalist. When you look at your people and, the, and the, you know, when I look at the, the photos and I look at the distraction, when I look at, you know, the older, the elderly trying to be taken care of, when I look at mothers and the young ones trying to, you know, leave Ukraine to, you know, at least to g- get to safety. What does this tell you um, about the people, about your people? about the Ukrainians? What, what have you learned about yourself and about Ukrainians throughout this whole period? So, I think that all the Ukrainians, they were used somehow for a complaint. Yeah. You know, how bad the things were, how things didn't work. Yeah. And now, when I talk to the people, also, for instance, in the villages which were liberated, mm-hmm. a lot of, many, many people say, you know, we didn't appreciate how good we live, how good was our life, how much we have to lose, and how actually we need to appreciate, you know, the, 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 the you know, our state, our country, our people. I and my journalists work with very sensitive and difficult issue. You know, yeah. we talk directly to the witnesses of alleged war crimes. Yeah. So people who live, which who lived through, through the war. Yeah. And what for me is amazing that somehow they pursue. Mm-hmm. They really, you know, the last time I'll give you an example, we had this horrible flood in because of the artificial explosion of the dam yes. in Kachovka. Yes. And one of the big cities, which was for nine months occupied, mm-hmm. then it was liberated, then yeah. it is constantly shelled. Yeah. And in the end, they needed to live through the flood uh, because of the explosion of the dam, which yeah. was caused by the Russians. Yeah. And I'm calling this lady who lost the house, who lost everything. She said it was everything for her. And she started her talk with like, oh, sorry, you are coming to visit me, but I wouldn't give you this pickles, this usual kind of things she do, the the, yeah. the, the uh, tomatoes she is like growing yeah. and she was like starting the conversation from the excuse yeah. she won't be able to give something with me because he, she has such a beautiful yard yeah. and a garden with growing so many things yeah. and she was regretting that she wouldn't give it. In the end I met her and she found something to give me anyway. Mm, mm. And it's really amazing that you know you would talk to the widow who lost her husband 
and her, her land, you know, they were farmers in the southern Ukraine. You know, they lost uh, because of her, her husband, she's elderly, didn't survive. He was tortured and he was murdered. But, you know, and she left alone and she couldn't, you know, deal with her crops. But in the end, she would take care so much, whether she given me some food because I came from some far away. Yeah. So I really think this, the, the, we, we saw that much of the atrocities, but we also saw so much of the humanities, how people support each other, yeah. how they find, how they do their best. Mm -hmm. Of course, not all. And by the way, a lot of people are returning to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever I, I talk to a refugee or to somebody, everybody wants to be home. Yeah. And a lot of people trying to be, you know, uh, to, to be back and find their way to, yeah. to, 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 to leave. I love that. It's the, it's the, you know, the humanity amongst the people of Ukraine and just the strength of the Ukrainians. But also, um, on the flip side, there's, you know, I mean, you write something quite beautiful here that... Uh, the, the Russians thought the bombs would break you, but instead they've actually made you stronger. But you know, you all have to be wary of everything happening around you. But also in the same essence, there's, there's also a lot of lack of humanity, so to say, from either, you know, other nations that be, from, you know, media, from, you know, other nations. A lot of people seemingly now sort of moving on from this war and acting like like it's, it's normal and it's, just, it's like people are not really talking about it as much as they should be as much as should be happening how, how does that make you feel and how do you see in terms of like journalism and ethics and and just the lack there of, of interest in the R R russia ukraine war so i think that it, it, it's clear that you know ukrainians also and that's also our fault didn't care about the other wars abroad we know there is a horrible war going on in you know in ethiopia and mm. we know that there is a war going on in yemen and there is less attention yeah. the difference i should probably explain because sometimes i'm asked with these things you know why even even those uh, in, in interest is fading you know why there is still so much interest to ukraine is it because we are in europe is it yeah. because you know this is a white population yeah. I think it's a bit different I think that the, the, the different things that um, in 2014 you know nine years ago when we had the uh, the democratic revolution against oppressive government mm -hmm. controlled by Russian mm -hmm. Ukrainians in the end succeeded you know yes. we had the pro-Russian president who fled to Russia mm -hmm. who was funded by Russia who was corrupt and then the Russians you know tried the first invasion yes. and within this year we were lucky and not just lucky we worked very hard very hard for nine years mm. the whole Ukrainian civil society yeah. media everybody yeah. to try to you know build more democratic country the feasible country a new army uh, you know br brought according to the different rules and in the end, it's this army, this society is defending itself. If we had now a authoritarian government and there would be the Ukrainian minority defending itself from Russia, I think that it would be, you know, way worse situation. Like mm. poor Syrians, you know, mm. they were not able to defend themselves. Yeah. In the end, the, con the country is in peril. The revolution, unfortunately, has lost. People lost their life and there is no prospect. Ukrainians managed to, you know, succeed then. So... That is the reason why, you know, there is support because it's not the rebels. There is a, the whole legit army of Ukrainians trying to defend itself in the, in the proper way. There is a state trying to, you know, like to, to, to keep the country going. Yeah. So it's difficult. Uh, so it's difficult, but, uh, you know, even the normal Ukrainians, as I mentioned, like a farmer. Of course, a farmer wouldn't think about the world or global politics. The person would think about the, um, you know, the their life and their children and their house. Yeah. But when I talk to these people, they do believe that they defend the, you know, the civilization. They defend the right of the people not to be killed. The right of the countries not to be you know, uh, occupied and invaded by bigger foreign uh, forces. Because yes. if we agree to the idea that any bigger foreign country can invade another country, we understand that nobody is secure. Luckily, in case of Ukraine, there is a chance to win. There is a chance to go on and pursue. And I think this hope 
that so much is at stake is really, and there is this probability of victory, you know, makes people uh, go on. Yeah. We are tired. And I said, like, uh, I think that the president of Ukraine, really, we, 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 we've done once an interview, said it very eloquently, saying that, like, people are tired maybe of the war of Ukraine, but believe we are not tired to, to, to defend everybody, to defend, yeah. you know, our country and, and, and the rest. So I think... I know the rules didn't work in a lot of conflicts. A lot of international system is not working, you know, uh, great. But for us, it's like that. If in case in Ukraine, where there is already some level of international solidarity, mm -hmm. stronger than in other conflicts, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it should be not the argument to say that we, we should deserve less support. I think the others should deserve more support. And also, if we can succeed and stop this, and, you know, say that maybe the international security should be treated differently. Maybe really the war criminals should be, you know, brought to the trial. Because if the, if it's impossible in case of Ukraine, it means yeah. it's impossible at all. At all so for anyone else, yeah. So there is a chance. Yeah. yeah. So if not here, then when? Because yes, we are maybe in a bit better situation than Ethiopians, than Yemen, than Yemenis, than Syrians. But if you... Ukrainians can be supported with all the moral clarity, with everything we can do. First of all, you know, it, in the end, despite all the discussion about NATO, anything, anything, we understand these are Ukrainians fighting, these are the Ukrainians dying, these mm -hmm. are the Ukrainians who are defending their land, mm -hmm. this is the Ukrainian territory which is, uh, you know, occupied or not occupied. So most of the things are done by the Ukrainians, with the will of the Ukrainians, um, uh, and and I think that especially people in Africa really, really understand the idea of sovereignty yeah. and understanding why it's so important to do what actually the people of the country want to yeah. and the Ukrainians want to defend themselves. I mean, even for... And that should be respected. Yeah, that should be respected. That's true. Even for me, um, like for a lot of people, you know, I mean, you find a lot of people having a conversation around, you know, Ukraine, you know, versus Russia, Russia versus Ukraine. Who do you support? And I mean, for me, the, the number one thing that I do, and I, and I make it very loud and clear, is I support humanity. The idea that anybody um, should be bombed or, you know, because, you know, they either want to join an alliance or should be bombed because they want to be more sovereign than, you know, that they feel they are. The concept of sovereignty for me comes before, but above all else, humanity also for me is very important. And I think... It's just something that people should be able to... It should be common sense that nobody should die because somebody else does not like who they associate themselves with or, you know, is nobody should die, period. Or should be killed, period, because of their beliefs. I, I, I really believe that we should be... Like you said, everybody should be able to respect that belief. But in the same... Again, in the, in, in the, in the, sort of in the same context, when the missiles go off and, you know journalists or people from around the world keep quiet they 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 are louder even in terms of the repercussions are louder but also when the missiles go off and they go silent there's also a huge weapon that also goes off that makes the missiles more louder and the repercussions and the atrocities bigger and this a lot of times is disinformation propaganda that is you know either from Russia or from other people who support Russia. So, I mean, what are some of the misconceptions, for example, that you have heard about the war that you feel needs to be sort of straightened out in terms of what people are hearing in the world? But also, the please give us a rundown of the, of the importance and the power of information in sort of a time of war like this. Uh I know that the Ukrainians, what I usually say, are already kind of vaccinated against, you know, disinformation in a way that they won't trust the, uh, you know, the, the Russian media, the Russian propaganda. Uh, uh, but I think in this case, are we even not speaking about, and I understand that there is a lot of disinformation coming, you know, about Ukraine or about why it's, you know, not the Ukrainian war, but some war between empires. Uh, but in the end, this is Ukrainian land and the Ukrainians are dying and the Ukrainians are fighting mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So this is a general narrative. 
Uh, but what I think is going on first, it's really about the respect to the victims. I give you a couple of examples. Yeah. You know, one of the first stories, uh, you just mentioned my first story uh, in The Guardian on the 20, you know, right after the, the invasion. Yeah. And on the cover of this magazine was the, uh, the photo, uh, it was the cover of The Guardian. It was also the photo of the Ukrainian lady which uh, was wounded uh, heavily uh, and she was in blood her face it happened that uh, by chance by chance i i figure out very mm-hmm. early that she is the mother of the classmate of my colleague mm-hmm. so i know i approach the colleague mm-hmm. and what this girl said uh, she said that her mother and she while she was writing and, and she lived in the town close to the russian border when she was writing somewhere, Instagram, elsewhere, she was bombarded by the trolls saying that she's fake. You know, yeah. it, it, nothing happened to her. Yeah. And it's very painful for the person to be denied, uh, you know, even like if the person was already wounded to say that, like, you don't exist. Yeah. I later seen a lot of, you know, Russian papers, official Russian papers, uh, which were printed out and given to the la- Russian soldiers in mm-hmm. the territories which were later occupied and the Russians later retreat when there was the same photo and there was this kind of stamp as if like it's fake, as if it's like the Westerners imagine it. And I, I, and then when I talk to the people, you know, people feel very vulnerable if something is, is like that. And mm-hmm. I give you something, a, a bit different example today, a year half, uh, a half. Unfortunately, you know, uh, two weeks ago, we lost a very dear friend, a Ukrainian writer, Victoria Amelina, the Ukrainian writer. Uh, she was killed during the air raid in Kramatorsk, in mm-hmm. the town closer to the front line. She went there with some Colombian writers. It was a pizzeria, uh, the pizzeria, and it was, you know, uh, shelled and bombed by a very precise, extremely expensive weapon, Iskander, which cost millions, you know, like millions. Mm. And they shelled pizzeria in the town, which is close to the front line, but where there were, were a lot of journalists, other people, but also the uh, the people, you know, maybe soldiers, but soldiers who were having, you know, dinner uh, in, in the town where they yeah. come to see their families. Yeah. And when you look to the Russian propaganda, you know, usually they would also say that, you know, they they targeted the second floor of this pizzeria. Mm-hmm. You should imagine how it looks. You know, you can imagine the pizzeria in Nairobi when there is just one floor and the yeah. tent, you know. Yeah. There is no second floor. Oh. It's not just not there. Mm. But what was also for me important, then when the trolls would come, and I would write this story. And as a journalist, I write a lot of stories. You know, I talk to the people. And they would say, but you know, somewhere in Iraq, in Gulf, there was invented story. You are stupid believing in such a bullshit. Mm. And for me, even for me, you know, at this moment, being a journalist, but knowing that there is a person whom I know and, and loved died in this attack and yeah. knowing it's real and we go into the funeral. To hear this, it's absolutely painful and devastating. Oh but there is something else. There is something else. What we also believe that beyond the usual uh, usual kind of propaganda, the information spreading lies and inventing the stories, or denying the right of the Ukrainians to mm. at least admit their uh, losses, uh, there is also the very strong, you know, not just hatred, but the, for... For many years, for for decades, the Russian mm. television was trying to cre- dehumanize Ukrainians, to create this ground to for the Russian soldiers against to kill kill them. Mm. So even in this particular case, there was the Russian general, um, uh, the Russian general who was speaking at the major Russian TV channel, mm. and this Russian general also is the member of the Russian parliament, the head of the. Uh, of the a committee for um, you know something like de- defense and things like that, so not the not the random person, and live on the record, he was saying that he takes he applauds this attack, wow. he takes hat off, and his military heart is rejoicing when he sees the pictures of people being digged out oh of the. Mm. attack because to his idea there are the soldiers or wherever he said even like these guys with tattoos there are civilians there are teenagers who have been killed 
So you understand that it reached this level that they even applauding to the attack yeah, when the, the whole death, world the knows. atrocities, yeah. With no repercussion whatsoever. So, so for us is to say that we cannot tolerate how we can try, you know, and if people, you know, there is something beyond humanity. We understand there is a propaganda, there is another version, there is a political, you know, discussion. You can like some side, you can, you know, dislike another. Okay, you know, I'm Ukrainian, I can give a lot of arguments why it's wrong, but I can understand it. But when there is a general, you know, applauding to the attack in which civilians were killed, yeah. uh, there is a different level how we can treat this war and the propaganda and what is spread by the... Uh, and I said, like, it's not the anonymous Telegram channel or the troll which came to my Twitter, mm. uh, which I cannot prove was it a Russian troll or not. Yeah. But it's something coming from the major, yeah. major program in yeah. the major Russian TV channel yeah. by the very important person yeah. uh, on the record. So that's what is uh, the, the reality. And I think that should be really treated in a different way. And and as you talk about that, I mean, I, I, I want to, I'll come back to that because we'll also talk about the war crimes and, you know, what a, what a perfect picture looks like in terms of the, you know, the, the pain that I feel, you know, the people of, of, of Ukraine are going through. But also when it comes to the, being tired and you know just having to go through these stories and to see the destruction and having to report it but also even amongst the people for me it's and you write about it it's very paradoxical that people feel guilty for not doing enough i mean what else can the people of ukraine do what what else can you do when there's all this what what else can you do i think that the best examples are the personal So my sister, the elder sister, uh, you know, she's a very calm, nice person. She's Mm. a lawyer and she works for city administration Mm -hmm. and uh, for some committee. And, you know, she has a small kid. Uh, She lives in the area of the town where, you know, on the outskirts. So when there is the Iranian drones flying, Mm -hmm. they're in a bigger risk than than uh, where I am live, so they need to go sometimes at night to the you know uh, bunker. Yeah. There is a Ukrainian defense which is shelling down these rockets, but you know she, it's a very tiresome life. But she now recently said that she's really like super tired because with her team she leaves the office at 11 p.m. Mm. every evening. We mm. have a curfew at 12, and I asked why, because she was like a secretary first for the commission for the people who. Uh, maybe whose houses were broken or something, the windows. Uh, mm. Kiev, you know, it's still a capital. It's more defended. It, there is less, uh, you know, less places bombed and destroyed, but still. And she said she was the secretary in the commission, which should need to register those things. So something would be the compensation for the people or something. Yeah. And then she was also as a lawyer in the commission for people who lost their their. Um, their housing or, or things like that. Yeah. And, you know, she's a civil servant. She works from 8 till 11. She has her family. She still works. She has a small boy. She needs to go at night to the bunker. But she said, like, you know, like, I'm almost there. I can't really make it. I, you know, like, she doesn't have strength. But she said, like, but maybe at least I can do something good for the people. Because yeah. if we, as a civil servant, you know, don't register this, uh, you know, how else should we do? So, of course, there are some people who, you know, maybe don't feel guilty. Uh, but I pray that everybody tries to do something. You know, even if you, like, a civil servant needs to spend without a day off in summer, um, you, you know, spend your time in registering these complaints mm. with some hope that maybe later somebody would receive a bit of the compensation. Uh, but I think these kind of efforts are, there, there are so many of them. And the people try to help each other. They go to different regions to help each other because it's existential. The problem that what we know what would happen in the occupied territories. People yeah. are killed and tortured. So you, you, you do where you, you try uh, also something to say. At the same time, you know, the life is going on in Kiev. The subway is working, the restaurants, bars, schools. It's summer, not schools, of course. But, uh, you know, the offices, we need to provide the electricity, the water, the life 
because we, we we want you know if we if you want to be crushed you try to live uh, as you do mm. and uh, pursuing is your way to when i heard the uh, and it's not something to be you know um, to be proud of yeah. but when the my colleague victoria melina we, we found out that you know that she died she was in the uh, hospital for five days mm-hmm. uh, and then there was a funeral but i needed to go to the south in ukraine to tell the story of the people who kind of uh, who lived after the flooding yeah. and you know i had this choice to to, to maybe stay for the funeral here in kiev but yeah. i was already out and as a journalist and as a person i understand that i i, I also need to move on I would pay the tribute to her and it's hard but for me it would be more devastating to stay at home yeah rather than to go working you know because while you're doing something it allows you to switch your mind and to think that maybe you can do at least something for somebody else who, who you know who is still there so I think this is the, the way to move but it's true that many people you know it, 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 it's harder for them and not everybody is, is capable uh, so um, you, you know to go on and to pursue and I, and I really, you know, do uh, share my sincerest condolences for, you know, especially the people who are close to you, people who you've worked with. I mean, you, you never know that, you know, the, when there's a war and I haven't experienced one, I can only imagine it becomes more personal when when those around you begin to fall by the, you know, by the wayside. And then you realize, oh my goodness, that this is actually, this is really, it's really happening. What and, 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 yeah. and I probably mm-hmm. want to go on with this because Victoria's story, why it also maybe would give an understanding. So you can imagine, not everybody in Ukraine is like that. There are yeah. simple people, farmers, soldiers. Victoria was a renowned, uh, you know, uh, writer. Uh, she, you know, spent a, a year on also documenting war crimes, yeah. you know, being here. And, uh, but, but she won in the end, uh, she was very well connected abroad because she also lived some time in the US and then m- moved to Ukraine. And she said, I talked to her two days before her death. You know, mm. we had the book festival here mm. and she won some uh, fellowship. She won some fellowship to move to Paris. And oh. what she said saying like, you know, um, I have the son who is 12 years old. I spent last year and a half running around, uh, you know, documenting war crimes. And this is the last year he's like a teenager. I, I need to be a mother. So mm. I accepted this fellowship, but I feel guilty of living because I, this life, this, this country is my strength. Mm. I don't feel good living. I mm. feel kind of, and I was trying to say, you know, like, go go for a year you'll be back there yeah. would be so much work for you yeah. still yeah. you have the right to make a break but we really were discussing she was kind of trying to explain how difficult it's for us mm. those who stay to leave because you think like it's your role it's your duty to be there yeah. you kind of can leave some of the people especially like her yeah. they can leave of course not every ukrainian but you see like a renowned writer in yeah. i think in every country yeah. probably yes but you feel the responsibility for your people and this is so unfortunate and sad what i'm just saying that in the end she was not able yes and, and yeah. her son would say of course in ukraine uh but i'm generally saying this idea of attachment that we do what we do you know and it's also our choice we are not you know it's not incited by somebody it's only our choice to defend our own people and, and be with them how, how do you do you feel sometimes overburdened um you know on, on the brink of despair for you as natalia this war definitely has had a huge impact for you but do you feel the times that you know i i i also need to rest i need to breathe i need to i need to i need to leave i need to flee or whatever how how do you feel as natalia it's uh you know so exactly with this particular recent tragedy that's something we thought that you know, you think like you still have your life in the end mm. uh, and you have some right to rest because you don't know. Uh, and that is a difference for us. I also have the international colleagues working on the project on the documenting war crimes. Mm. And sometimes maybe I'm very rude or maybe too blunt and maybe, you know, don't have strength any longer to be polite. But they want, if they want to go something for planning for a year and ask about this long-term plan, and I'm saying, like, you're very smart, it's very good. But, you know, me and the team here, we don't know. You know, mm. would it be there, this city, or not? 
it's there. Now it's like perfectly fine. We, we kind of maintain, try to maintain normal life and sometimes even enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, but also, if you lose somebody forever, you know you lose somebody forever. There is no silver lining. There is no kind of good in that. Some people won't be returned. Yeah. You just really can do something for those who stay. Yeah. The only thing you can say, like, maybe you need to treat better and be nicer and kinder for the people who are around you. Sometimes stop. And what is oddly interesting as well in Ukraine, sometimes people maybe uh, feel, especially from outside, you know, angry, mm. uh, maybe more determined. At the same time, I think we are a bit kinder to each other. So wherever I meet the person I know, you know, uh, even if it's a professional relations and a partner, not, not, not kind of a friend, you still kind of ask, how are you? How is your family? How is everything? Because mm. everybody lives through something. If there is an airstrike or, you know, a sleepless night, we're all in the same boat. Depending, mm. you're a minister or a person or you have your kids, you have your family. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in this regard, it, it's really hard. You never know where to stop. Um, and do you sometimes feel that like, can I do better? That's why this idea of, you know, that, oh, can you just give up? Feels a bit like in, in, in just because yeah. it's also feeling just to those who passed away yeah. that you feel in, not just in the memory, yeah. you, you need to do something that it's all not in vain. That yeah. if there is a war crime, it should yeah. be investigated. It shouldn't be just left and accepted. So this this gives you strength. This this gives you resilience. So it it it, it, it is like a, a duty. But uh, of course we 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 we're becoming tired. Uh, and uh, uh, and I also saying that we have we are very hopeful. We are yeah. very hopeful because we see the reason. But we also shouldn't allow that this is all in vain because it would be just unjust to you know to anybody who lost their life to lost everything mm. uh, to 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 because you know the future is the the the, the idea of being occupied mm -hmm. is worse because yeah. if somebody speaks about the war and peace for ukrainians to give up you know it's to allow their occupation and mm -hmm. occupation is not the peace Mm -hmm. Occupation is not the peace. Mm -hmm. Occupation is just a different form of the war. Mm. Well, wow, that's 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 really deep. As we conclude, I mean, uh, there's just two last things that are, you know. One is how do you see this, you know, ending? You've been you've covered other atrocities. You've covered other other wars. I mean, what for you would be the scenario of how this comes to a stop, or at least a pause for the people of Ukraine and for everyone else who's been involved? And also, what's your word, you know, to you know, to Zelensky, your president, to the military, uh, you know, at, at the front fighting for for the sovereignty of Ukraine, to the people of Ukraine? What do you want to tell them? So, you know, it's very, again, simple. Look, if Ukrainians stop fighting, they'll be occupied. Mm -hmm. If the Russians stop fighting, there would be peace in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's enough for them to leave. Mm -hmm. I think that the person like Putin doesn't need to have the... Uh, you know, to save his face. We yeah. heard recently that there was this kind of non-happening coup. And in the end, he got out of this situation. Yeah. So we shouldn't care about how he feels. It's so easy for them. Just stop shelling, you yeah. know. So for us, the war is them leaving, leaving the territory and as well, stop shelling on the Ukrainian territory. And that's as, you know, to be honest, they can, they just really can stop at any given moment. Mm. We cannot. Mm. Uh, so this is very different. But for the Ukrainians, then it's, you know, some genuine, and even if it depends not just on us, there should be some genuine guarantee yeah. that Russia wouldn't stop. Um, for, for the last years, the peace agreement, which was lasting for last eight years, Mm -hmm. actually helped Russia to build the army and the occupied territories, uh, Ukrainian territories where Russia has been occupying for eight years. Mm. That was exactly the reason. They built the military playground of those territories in order to make the further, further occupation. Wow. So we already lived for eight years with this peace agreement, mm. which while they were having the break, yeah. They just made their army stronger and prepared for this mm. war. This cannot happen again. So this pause, the only thing of this pause would be the, uh, you know, that that the Russia would regroup, 
create more military weapons, their factories would create more missiles yeah. and things like that. So yeah. there should be some guarantee of non, um, non-attack, mm-hmm. which would be, you know, uh, I use this word genuine, which we yeah. can believe in and, and trust into that. Yeah. That's some, somehow the, the only way, but it's very easy to imagine it. You know, it's just like at night, they don't shell. That's it. Isn't it easy? Okay. And what about your message to, you know, your fellow Ukrainians, to, you know, journalists, um, your fellow journalists, your colleagues, your, you know, the military, I mean, the common guy, the farmer, the trader, the teacher, you know, the policeman who's just trying to, you know, help people to move along and, and all that, and also to your President Zelensky. Look, so for me, I uh, consider to be this like Kiev-based intellectual with a very clear political conscious why we need to defend our country and and things like that. Mm. So wherever I meet a soldier, a postman, as a worker from the railway or the president or anybody, I see people who are working very, very hard. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I can say to my fellows is that I am absolutely grateful yeah. because I know that they cannot do that, but they do even more. They work hard. They do it while, you know, also they don't see their families on, on the edge of their physical resources. Yeah. So my usual thing is really, we are now used to thank each other. Mm-hmm. You know, we are getting used to thank each other for everybody what people do. I, I feel absolutely grateful for, you know, a, 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 mo- a, a bank worker who, who still do the job while there is a missile, but I need that. For a teacher who maybe do the job you know, teaching the person, the kid in his town, but also the kid who left via Zoom. Mm. For volunteer, for civil servants who might not do this work, but still remain, you know, after working hours. So, so this is my own gratitude to, and it's also, of course, for the soldiers, because we should understand that today the Ukrainian army mainly consists of the people who were yesterday also, you know, journalists or IT workers or, you know, farmers, and they did something unusual because in there, of course, the probability of the death is very high and there is nothing else. Uh, You know, this is an incredible sacrifice. They don't belong to themselves. They voluntarily gave given up their freedom because in the end, we need to accept that if the, if the army fights against you, it's just the army which can defend you. I, my word means nothing if, to, to, to the Russian soldiers. So in the end, it, it's just the gratitude for their work and sacrifice. Wow, oh, I like that. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia, for your time, for your dedication, for your resilience, and you know, and and just for your commitment to your country and for and for really giving uh, yourself so much uh, to sp- uh, spread light and share the light, and most importantly, to highlight um, the people of Ukraine at very di- at a very very difficult time. And I do hope and pray that you know, I mean, that this this weight can be lighter and like you said i hope that one day the shelling will stop and you know and the and the cries and the screams of children playing in the fields will be louder than the shelling i really do look forward to that day thank you so much anthony uh, thank you for for audience for taking the time the busy time uh, uh and paying attention also cool thank you Thank you, Natalia. Thank you so much for that. That was really beautiful. I mean, you, wow, that was powerful. Thank you so much.